Welcome to this um, Ocean Decade virtual uh, webinar series, the 16th session actually of this series. Uh, from the ocean science we have to the one we need is the title. Um, we have an excellent panel for you. I will be sharing this. I have the honor of sharing this. Um, just briefly introduce myself. My name is Jan Mees. I'm the director of the Flanders Marine Institute in Ostend, Belgium. Uh, and I was the co-chair of the editorial board of the Global Ocean Science Report 2020. And I'm also a member of the um, decade informal working group on monitoring and evaluation that is uh, taking basically the outcome of the Global Ocean Science Revo uh, Report further to uh, establish a evaluation and monitoring framework for the outcome, the successes of the decade that we all uh, look forward to. Uh, the seminar that we have today is um, timely. Eh? The, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development has just started on January 1st. Uh, and not long before that, uh, and it's not a coincidence, of course, in December 2020, we launched the Global Ocean Science Report 2020 that basically charged the capacity for ocean sustainability. It was released in December. And now it is the time to... Um, uh, have a webinar that provides us with the occasion to reflect on where we stand, a stock taking moment. Where do we stand in terms of ocean science investment, in terms of human capacity, in terms of technical capacities, data management, uh, also the quantification of science output. And based on the findings that are presented in the Global Ocean Science Report 2020, we hope to engage in a dialogue with ocean science users and producers uh, supported by an excellent panel uh, today, experts in their respective fields. We have uh, two objectives with the presentations and the discussions of today. Uh, we want first to assess current investments and capacity gaps in ocean science. And secondly, we want to identify measures on how to minimize or even close these gaps over the period of the ocean decade. So we want to uh, reflect on where we are at the moment. Uh, we want to think about where we are going and uh, what is the road to uh, get there? So maybe if I can, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, uh, before we start, we have some um, uh, practicalities, some housekeeping rules for you. Um, some useful uh, information I'm waiting for the, I don't see the next slide yet. Uh, I'm not sure about the participants, whether they can see it. Uh, no, uh, I'll just go through them. There are only four uh, things I should measure, mention. Uh, first of all, um, the session is recorded. So, um, uh, after the recording, we will have a link to access the recording that will be shared on the Ocean Decade event webpage. Um, that is uh, displayed now, uh, the, the web address. We also invite you to uh, ask questions. You have the opportunity to ask questions during the session. Uh, please uh, submit your questions uh, written. Uh, through the platform to the different panelists uh, for the Q&A period that is organized at the end of the webinar. Um, we encourage you to share these uh, questions through the talks. We will not uh, deal with them right after the talks, but we will save it to the Q&A session at the end. But please, when you submit a question, uh, also include your name. Um, and the panelists to whom you want to address the question if that is relevant. Yeah, so that um, this is a, an efficient way forward, we think. Uh, the summary of this meeting, of this webinar, and the PowerPoint presentations that you will be seeing will be available on the Ocean Decade website uh, that you should follow anyway, I think, uh, in the next uh, weeks, months, and years. Uh, all participants are uh, automatically muted. Uh, um, that's also important to know that uh, we control who can be heard uh, and we only take questions um, in a written form. Otherwise, it's uh, not manageable, uh, we think. Okay, that's it. I think, I think now we can move to the next slide that will introduce you to the uh, panel uh, and the program uh, that we will follow. 
Uh, first speaker uh, in a couple of minutes will be Kirsten Isensi, a program specialist of the IOC UNESCO, uh, who also um, is the coordinating editor of the Global Ocean Science Report 2020 <clears throat> and is a member of the Decade Informal Working Group on Monitoring and Evaluation. Uh, Kirsten will talk about the key findings from the Global Ocean Science Report 2020. That will then be followed by a number of presentations highlighting specific uh, inventories of ocean science capacity that have been established in the Gossers. Uh, first, we will have uh, Claire Jolie from the OECD who will talk about investments in ocean science from the data in Gosser 2020. Um, then we will have Karina from uh, Schuchman from the uh, Copernicus Marine Service who will talk about the technical um, capacity we have from ocean observations to indicators is the title of our presentation. Uh, next, we will have uh, Linwood Pendleton from the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution um, on the ocean in Norway, who will um, talk about data management issues, the ocean data challenges. Uh, next, Hans Otto Pörtner from the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany, who will reflect on the size out science outcomes of the uh, decades. Uh, then we have a presentation by Alison Clausen from the decade team of the IOC UNESCO. Uh, program specialist who will talk, will give us a brief presentation of the implementation plan of the ocean decade, including progress on the development of a monitoring and evaluation uh, framework. And we will end with a country perspective. Jay Hak Lee from the Korea Institute of Ocean Science and Technology will introduce us to best practices um, of marine science, the current status and uh, the future of ocean science in the Republic of Korea. So that's our panel. This is the, that's the program. Uh, we will start immediately so that we can uh, do this all within the one hour and a half that we have uh, reserved for this. And I first give the floor to Kirsten uh, Isense, program specialist from IOC uh, UNESCO. And as I said before, the um, coordinating editor of the Global Ocean Science Report 2020. Kirsten, please. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. And I'm very happy to be with you all here today to give a little overview about the Global Ocean Science Report 2020, what it, the data chose and also some of the conclusions. <clears throat> um, next slide, please. So let me first start a little bit on the background um, of the Global Ocean Science Report 2020. It's the second edition of the Global Ocean Science Report series. And um, the the gathering data, the writing of it was really a global endeavor. We had 45 member states um, contributing to our survey, um, which contained um, a lot of questions about capacity, about investment, about data management, about sustainable development, and uh, 45 member states uh, contributed to that. Um, and many more are also presented in the results uh, when it comes to our bibliometric, so and technometric and gender specific analysis. Um, our editorial board, which was uh, co-chaired by, by Jan, um, contained, was comprised of, of 12 uh, experts and um, from 12 countries. And, um, but they, and we didn't do that alone. We had really the support from 35 countries from all five IOC electoral groups. This, product because it's, it's really something which takes time and which uh, has a lot of effort um, also went through um, uh, external and internal uh, review. Um, and those included um, scientific expert, but also governmental representative and UN agencies. And of course there was a huge team around as well in the IOC secretariat and also support by countries which made that um, just possible. Next slide, please. So as Jan also already introduced, the Global Ocean Science Report 2020 is kind of yeah, pro providing the baseline, uh, hopefully for policymakers, academics, and other stakeholders seeking to assess the progress towards the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda in specific, with a specific focus on ocean science. And so it's um, 
where do we stand in terms of our ocean science capacity? Because only if we know what we have, we can also improve it and identify gaps. We have this 250 page, but there's also executive um, summary, and this is, uh, can be downloaded in all uh, six uh, UNESCO languages. The Global Ocean Science Report itself is a report, but there's also a database related to it, which uh, features all those primary data we obtained from the, um, from the member states. And um, we hope that it also will facilitate then in the future um, updates on a more regular basis than every four to five years. Next slide, please. So let me dive directly into some of the main findings. As I said, we looked at the human capacity and it's really, there's a huge uh, variation among member states, about among countries, um, how many researchers are employed per million inhabitant, which reaches to less than one to over 300. However, this doesn't mean that rich countries have the biggest uh, human capacity. No, it's actually not related to um, GDP. The champions here, uh, like um, it was also already shown in, um, in the first uh, Global Ocean Science Report, uh, are Norway, Portugal, and Sweden. Next slide, please. When we dive a little bit uh, deeper in, in the human capacity and focus on the gender aspect, and I think that's really at, at the heart as well of, um, of this report and uh, of a lot of the, the findings, we, um, we, we saw again that gender equality in ocean science is far from having been achieved, but it's a challenge which we can realistically, hopefully uh, manage because we have 39% of global ocean scientists uh, are women. This is 10% uh, higher than it is for natural science in general. However, there's a big discrepancy between regions and also fields of um, ocean science with um, more than 50% of women um, being ocean scientists in ocean health and human well-being and, um, and human health. And, uh, above, yeah, a little bit uh, over, over 30 uh, in um, ocean observation and ocean crust and marine habits. Next slide, please. We also see ocean science is growing and so is the output. So we see uh, global ocean science outputs are continuously rising, though some regions and in particular Asia is really growing fast. And, um, so we, we see that um, the, the output um, and the, the knowledge uh, we, we have and we regain from ocean science is um, really um, growing, not only the, the articles, but also the journals which focus on ocean science. What we also see, and I think that um, relates very much to, um, to the decade as well and the importance is of, um, collaboration. And so we see that um, scientific papers, which have multiple um, authors from multiple countries have a huge, bigger impact factor. So it's really, they, they get cited, they get, um, they get recognized. Next slide, please. And, um, but ocean science doesn't stop there. It also gets applied. And for the first time, we now uh, made an attempt to show how ocean science is reflected in uh, patterns. And so we had a, a technometric uh, analysis and ocean science findings are converted into applications for society, technologies or applications for mitigation or adaptation to climate change. Those are the main fields uh, where ocean science is, is really um, taken up. However, there is a, still, I think um, this is underexplored by the blue economy, ocean economy, making use of our science. And I think the upcoming 10 years uh, with the decade will also raise this, um, yeah, this, the use of, of ocean science in uh, application. It, the, the increasing use as well, which is already measurable of ocean science in, in, um, in, 
in application reflects the increasing recognition of the ocean's role in regulating the climate and the negative impact of anthropogenic change on ocean health. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but um, though we have all those publications and those as well all over the world, this is not equally distributed of course, over the world. And so is not the access to the ocean. The access to technical infrastructure to observe, to research uh, the ocean ecosystems is unequally distributed and countries in the Southern hemisphere only have limited access to ocean science uh, technologies and infrastructures besides a few, um, yeah, besides a few. Um, also, this, as I said, the direct access to um, to the ocean with research vessels is um, is quite quite concentrated in in some countries, like for example the U.S., which is maintained more than is maintaining more than a third of the global research fleet. Next slide, please. And um, <clears throat> and though we know about, and it's probably not for me here to convince this audience about the importance of the ocean, the investment made by countries um, doesn't reflect that yet. On average, only 1.7% of the national research budget are allocated to ocean science, and this is really varying a lot. Some countries also actually step um, a little bit further and, um, and are yeah, produce, um, giving more than this 1.7, even with a very small um, R&D budget in, in general. Next slide, please. And then to kind of see how does this ocean science as well feed in, in to sustainable development directly and how um, can we make sure that there is a relation um, from the scientist to New York, to the, um, to the UN General Assembly, do they have internally this focus, do countries have internally this focus on SDG 14, which focuses on ocean science? And again, the, a lot of countries have reporting and have a focus on sustainable development. However, from those um, 70 countries which have a strategy to achieve sustainable development, only uh, 21 of those 70, um, only 21% focus, um, have a focus as well on SDG 14. And I think there's a, um, still a long way to go that we um, get this national focus um, and then hopefully also um, increase the uh, investment to ocean science because I always say it's investment and not a cost. However, still quite often um, ocean science is seen as a cost and um, I think it, it's an investment in the future. So to finalize, um, what are the next steps? Uh, some clear findings which were um, collected and, and recommendations by the um, editorial board uh, was as well, there's a need to enhance the current level of funding for ocean science. We need to establish continuous collection of international comparable data on investment in ocean science and as well on this um, on, on the capacity, because as um, as mentioned, if we don't know what we actually have in ocean science capacity, we also don't know um, where we should go. We should um, there's a need to facilitate co-design of ocean science by involving uh, ocean science information users and producers, and this is what uh, we are also discussing here, and is also one of the major objectives of the decade. Promote multi-stakeholder partnership in ocean science and operationalize transfer of marine technology, improve the capacity building and make it, make it fit for purpose, the ocean science we have. Move towards ocean science capacity development with the equal participation of all countries, genders and ages, uh, embracing local and indigenous knowledge. There's a need to develop strategies and implementation plans to support the career needs of women and young scientists. And we, find to, uh, we need to find solutions to remove barriers for open access to ocean data, which is still not, um, yeah, like the default in a, in a lot of uh, countries and regions. There's a need to foster education and training and of professionals related to ocean science. And finally, being now in this crisis and 
um, <clears throat> the COVID pandemic, there's also um, a need to, to see how does that affect the, the maintenance and the sustainability of ocean science um, so that we can act on time to not lose important data and information which was um, which is produced by a lot of scientists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten. Very nice presentation. You can see the web information on the accessibility of the Global Ocean Science Report on the slide before you. We now move to the next speaker, um, Claire Jolly. Claire is head of unit in the Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, where she is in charge of the OECD research and analysis on the economics and innovation dimensions of the frontier domains, ocean and space. Uh, Claire was also a member of the editorial board of the Global Ocean Science Report 2020, and she will reflect on the investments in ocean science. Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jans. So my name is Claire Jolie, and I, indeed I work for the OECD where I had the um, STI Ocean Economy Group. Uh, I was one uh, of the co-authors of this chapter on investment in ocean science, and it's really a pleasure uh, to be here presenting some of the results uh, from this work. Next slide, please. So we need ocean science to support both a healthy and productive ocean and to understand better and deal with the mounting pressures from many economic sectors, accelerating climate change and biodiversity loss. So the main rationale for this uh, chapter on uh, investment uh, in ocean science is really the, the need to take stock of the funding resource that exists today to support programs and using this as a baseline as the ocean science of tomorrow needs to be prepared today. So the majority of fundings comes from public funding and this is quite complex to actually map the funding streams in ocean science. As you can see here in this slide, we do have many different national situations. There's also a wide diversity of public actors involved in funding ocean science at national level. We're talking about research ministry, but also defense. We're talking about many different types of actors. There's also a variety of regional international programs that are also funding directly ocean science projects. And one interesting finding uh, from this particular chapter uh, is the role of philanthropy and the private sector in funding ocean science. Next slide, please. So here I'll, I'll go through some of the findings. You will have access to all the slides uh, on the, the website. Uh, and of course, all the information can be found directly in the report. So in terms of the governmental funding, which again is really at the core of many uh, ocean, ocean science programs today, um, they vary widely between countries. You have here the top uh, budgets, I would say, with uh, the United States uh, leading the way with the largest budget, which includes both ocean and coastal government programs and ocean science is really hidden in there. We do have then uh, as top two and top three, Japan and Australia, and six countries allocate budgets of over 200 million uh, US dollars uh, on ocean science per year. This means that you still have uh, dozens and dozens of countries which have very limited budgets for ocean science. So we are talking here really about very big differences between countries. Next slide, please. In terms of, um, I would say, the sustainability of science budgets, there we see a lot of uh, diversity and also a lot of volatility. Uh, when looking uh, at the data that we gathered via the uh, Global Ocean Science Report questionnaire, we found that quite a number of countries actually had major changes in their ocean science budgets over time. This is uh, over a five-year period, and we see that 14 countries had actually increased their budgets uh, quite remarkably, I would say, um, while nine have actually reduced uh, their budgets. Uh, Japan in particular, with a reduction of 15% uh, of its uh, ocean science budget. This means again 
that for ocean science to be really sustainable, uh, it's always a challenge because from year to year, you could have large differences in different national budgets. Next slide. Now, when comparing ocean science with the rest, I would say, of, of uh, the field of research and innovation, it's actually tiny, it's quite small. Uh, it's a very difficult exercise to provide some good comparable data, but here using um, a bit as a proxy, the idea of looking at ocean science budget as a share of the gross domestic expenditure on research and development, uh, we find indeed that it's relatively or even very, very small. On average, it's around 1.7% of national good in countries, but that ranges really uh, between 0.0.3%, uh, all the way to 11, uh, more than 11% for some countries. Meaning again, that ocean science is really hidden in, uh, in other budgets, but also per se, it's still very small. Next slide, please. And good news, I would say, is that, as we already mentioned, uh, Kristen and I, uh, governments play a key role in actually putting together budgets for ocean science. But the number of private foundations and private actors contributing to ocean activities and ocean science program is actually growing. That won't ever replace the key role of public actors but I think it's very good news for uh, a number of ocean science programs. Here you have some data and over five years, private foundations and donors have provided around 668 million to marine science projects. But this is through more than 6,000 different grants. The strength of having this new funding is a little bit put in geo parody by the diversification and the disparity of grants that are provided. And that also translates very often in small scale projects or very limited projects in time. So here I think a key role for uh, foundations, private sector will be to engage with the ocean science community in order to provide maybe more long duration grants, new mechanisms to actually make sure that indeed the ocean science programs are lasting they get some benefits out of this, obviously. Right now, the private sector supports ocean science via very different mechanisms, typically grants for education, training programs, PhD programs in a number of ocean research centers, but they also provide uh, sometimes infrastructure, access to uh, some of the data. We see this partnership with these relatively new actors actually playing a big part in the next steps for the UN ocean science decade. Next slide. So what next? Um, I think we are all convinced in this webinar and beyond, I think the message is getting stronger and stronger that ocean science will really be a foundation for managing activities in the ocean in a sustainable way. Um, but at the end of the day, public objectives will be the key driver, I would say, to get the right funding in place. Also more actors uh, will be benefiting and contributing to ocean science programs. A big step again will be having the good relationships established with many of these actors as the ocean science decade actually gains um, momentum. And maybe a final point here, and that will be my first slide in just a second, to make sure that we have the right information, we do believe that indeed we need continuous measurement of the ocean science funding and quite a number of other indicators. We need milestones. We need to be able to feed evidence in particular to policymakers that are supporting ocean science program. And we believe there's a lot of statistical work that needs to be done. The OECD is working with IOC and with uh, quite a number of other actors which are supporting uh, our ocean economy work in order indeed to explore research, the new types of indicators that could be helpful for the ocean science community and beyond for policymakers as to make sure that uh, they all get the best of, I would say, in the decade to come. So with this, I'll stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. Jan? Thank you for your presentation, Claire. Very nice. Uh, I see also that we uh, 
have quite a few questions um, in the chat. Uh, I would advise uh, attendees to post them in the Q&A uh, section of the webinar. That's easier uh, to manage them. And we'll come back to these questions later, uh, Claire, after in the Q&A session at the end of all presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. We uh, uh, move straight on to our next uh, panelist, uh, Karina von Schuckmann, who is a physical oceanographer specialized in ocean climate monitoring at Mercator Ocean, France. Um, Karina is chair uh, of the Copernicus Marine Service Ocean Reporting Framework, uh, lead author of IPCC uh, reports, uh, and she also contributed to the recent uh, Global Ocean Science Report that we are discussing today. Karina will um, give us uh, some perspectives on the technical capacity from ocean observations to indicators uh, from a Copernicus Marine Service perspective. Karina, if you please. Thank you very much, Jan, for the introduction and thank you very much for the uh, uh, invitation to contribute. So I will discuss um, on the topic from ocean observations to indicators. I will discuss the importance of the ocean observations for all three pillars of sustainable development, the environment, society and economy. And I will also discuss on how observing system requirements evolve globally from um, past to present and for the future and how the combination of observ observations and added value information from science can support the knowledge transfer um, through uh, the use of indicators. Next slide, please. I will start with the um, presentation of the SDG 14 at the center of the entire SDG framework by discussing that all SDGs are interconnected and SDG 14 supports the UN 2030 agenda and the SDGs as a whole. So the ocean offers opportunities to face causes and consequences of climate change globally and locally, calling for a dramatic scaling up of efforts towards ambitious mitigation and adaptation. So in this context, a holistic approach that embraces sustainable ocean stewardship informed by science data and services to support society and economy is required to create the future we want. And the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development is an essential foundation to achieve this objective. Next slide, please. So this is a representation to uh, again, underline the importance, the critical role of the ocean uh, within uh, the earth system, but also within the SDG framework. And here's just some examples, I do not have time to detail, but for example, for the three pillars for environment, with the ocean's role of uh, the capacity to store a large amount of heat of carbon, for example, it's a central um, um, ecosystem service or for society with the adaptation or importance for disaster risk management, and also for the economy on the uh, sustainable blue economy and the trading and shipping. Next slide, please. So, in order to support and to further understand the critical role and the changes, ocean observations are fundamental. And they are fundamental to growing understanding of the ocean environment and its role within the Earth system. So the Ocean Ops Conference was a, an important step which took place in 2019, I'm sorry, there's an error, which had um, established and accomplished a um, huge number of uh, observing system recommendation for the different applications. So through the process from these different observing ocean ops conferences and their simulation of recommendations from the entire ocean community um, and uh, the collaboration, the ocean observing system has evolved from a platform centric perspective to an integrated observing system. And you can access all the different recommendations uh, for the different questions uh, you have interest uh, on this web page, where you can find all the white papers. So the different key phenomena, without going detail, this is the representation for the physical part, is can range from scales of meters up to um, a thousand, ten thousand of kilometers, and addressing oscillation and waves and going up to sea level changes and long term and water mass changes and the storage components. So the challenge is now for the observing system to evolve, to respond to an increasingly diverse, diverse end user group. Next slide, please. So the way forward to achieve this is now to explore the opportunities and the challenges for the development of a fit for purpose, sustained and prioritized ocean observing system with maximal support for fundamental research, climate monitoring, forecasting and society. 
I've copied here without being able to go into details, a list of so-called essential ocean variables as um, developed under framework for ocean observing within uh, the global ocean observing system on the IOC. So the re recommendations provided here guided by this framework is to identify user requirements by considering time and space scales for a range of applications and to focus on innovation areas where existing technology do not meet those requirements. Next slide, please. Then in a specific focus I uh, wanted to provide is also on how we can improve the um, information flow, a science-based information flow to between the different pillars of sustainable development in order to communicate the results and to use uh, an optimal wise and to inform um, society. Um, society. So um, the added value chain is one of a representation uh, which connects the core of the ocean and climate services and connecting raw products from the different observing system and CETO measurements or remote sensing or observation measurements and oceanographic science knowledge to high quality data products. And then with additional added value and expertise from a various multidisciplinary field of experts, ocean experts to indicators. So these added value products can provide evidence basis for agencies and reporting bodies, decision makers, other stakeholders, and the public yielding societal and economic benefit. So the indicators which should be based on the essential ocean variables as discussed on my previous slide was to play a central role at the science and policy, policy and science and private inter sector interface and to support the optimized use of environmental information through the added value chain. Next slide, please. So there are some examples on how ocean indicators are already in use and how they can support this information exchange. There's an example on the so-called WMO GCOS Global Climate Indicator Framework. Um, this is a, an application for the topic of climate change on which there are several ocean-related indicators already in identified, such as heat content, ocean acidification, sea level, and uh, sea ice change. And those are regularly assessed uh, by experts information through this indicator framework uh, nurse the WMO state of the global climate, which in turn provides information at the UNFCCC level. Next slide, please. Now the example is a notion indicator framework from the Copernicus Marine Service which is providing regular information on, on different specific uh, indicators and providing um, short information on numerical values and visualizations. And um, beside the dissemination and information of people who can all download those uh, information um, from the web portal, it's open access. Uh, this also informs a regular reporting activity, particularly summary for policymakers as part of the Copernicus Marine Service reporting activities. Next slide, please. So what next still um, the availability of defined indicators is not um, reflecting the, uh, the complexity of the ocean's role in the earth system. And so a next step is to develop a new global indicator framework for ocean indicators. So provide the first definition of what should be an ocean indicator. It is a simple, easy to understand tool to describe, measure, and monitor complex ocean phenomena. And the ocean indicator may change globally to locally at different timescales and can be utilized for ocean literacy and to build a sustainable ocean observing system for holistic scientific assessment and stewardship. So currently under the way, there's a development of an internationally agreed global ocean monitoring indicator framework to provide authoritative scientific underpinning for global ocean assessment for state of the ocean repairs and for assessing the capacity of ocean observing system to provide the data and information required for societal benefit barriers. For well, the information can be found IOC, OOPC and also in the GSET future of the seas and ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. Um, very nice presentation, also very rich in information, uh, like all the presentations we've seen so far. So if you have questions, uh, dear attendees, don't hesitate to post them in the Q&A section. We move on then to um, ocean data challenges. So we have uh, Linwood Pendle Pendleton as a panelist. Uh, Linwood is the Senior Vice President for Science at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Ocean in Oslo, Norway. He also holds the International Share of Excellence at the European Institute for Marine Studies 
in France and uh, Linwood serves also at the interim, on the interim decade advisory board. Uh, data management, Linwood, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Jan. And, and thank you everyone for being here. It's a real pleasure and an honor to spend a little bit of time with you. What I wanna do um, in my seven minutes is just touch on what I see as some of the real promises of ocean data, um, particularly for sustainable development over the next 10 years, and also focus on some of the challenges. So go ahead and go to the next slide, please, and I'll just jump right in. You know, on the promises side, the, the good news is we have more ocean data than we've ever had. More data has been contributed to the World Ocean Database, which is sort of the, the big global set of ocean data that we use for a lot of our climate modelings and really to understand ocean change. More data has been contributed to that World Ocean Database in the last 10 years than all of the previous years. And, you know, we have more and more ways of collecting data than ever before. And you can go to the next slide, please. Um, we are, are way beyond just collecting data with ships and field scientists. We, of course, have satellites and drones. We have gliders and floats and buoys and, and even sail drones now that are collecting data all over the world. And you can go to the next slide. Um, and at all depths now, it, you know, we are able to collect data using autonomous underwater vehicles um, and, and deep Argo buoys, for instance, down to 5,000 meters deep. So it's giving us a, just an incredibly um, rich understanding now of, of ocean conditions and ocean change from surface to seafloor. So that's a, a really important advance. In addition to having more data in more ways of collecting data. We actually have more kinds of data than we ever have had before. The World Ocean Database now has more than 40 different kinds of variables in it, but there's still all sorts of data that um, hasn't even begun to enter the World Ocean Database that we're really just exploring now. Uh, I think probably all of you are familiar with um, different techniques for using images, whether it's from satellites or underwater to assess biodiversity, but um, we're also using videos for this sorts of things and our ability to collect real information, especially biodiversity information from imagery has really taken off over the past few years. Uh, another place I think that is really exciting for me is, is the way we use acoustic data. And so it's not just using acoustic data to listen to whale songs, um, while that's important, but we're able to use acoustic data to assess fish stocks and to measure ecosystem integrity and even to identify biodiversity that's in the area. Very similar to that, we have environmental DNA and other molecular techniques that are able to sift ocean water in order to identify what kinds of organisms have been in the vicinity. And this is really, I think, going to unlock our ability to collect biodiversity data at very large scales across the, the ocean. Um, and not just sort of what biodiversity is there, but how it's changing um, information about its abundance. And then some of these molecular techniques called genomics can even tell us about sort of the condition of organisms. And, and so that's super exciting. I think another thing that we're seeing that really gives me lots of hope is that the cost of collecting data is dropping significantly. And this is putting data collection devices into the hands of many more people, which means we can collect data in more places than ever before. And you'll hear a lot in the ocean decade about democratizing ocean data and ocean science. We want everyone to really feel like they have an opportunity to contribute to ocean science. And so this decrease of, of cost is helping. Um, but going with all of this sort of new data, it's important to recognize that there's a lot of analytical power that's coming along with this that I think is really changing the usefulness of the data and the power of this data. And one of the things that I feel is, is really promising is our ability now to combine different kinds of data much faster and more easily than we've ever been able to do that before. So um, where I work, we, we have something that we call the Ocean Data Platform, and it really uses a technique called data fusion um, to help us combine these formerly uncombinable data. And when you are able to combine these large global data sets of ocean data, combining oceanographic data with climatological data, with biodiversity data, and even human data, um, it really unlocks the ability to use 
artificial intelligence and deep learning techniques to really make sense of this data. And that I think is really going to open up our understanding of ocean processes. And Karina mentioned how complex the ocean is. We really need this kind of AI and deep learning help to, to understand how ocean change really will affect biodiversity, ecosystems, and people. Our ability to use AI too means that we're moving more and more from using ocean data as a way of kind of documenting what has happened to our ocean to really creating models that help us see what could happen. I mean, this is gonna be particularly important for sustainable development because policymakers, decision makers, um, businesses and, and, and the like need to be able to kind of model what the impact is of different actions that we take to steward the ocean. So I think that is um, that's a, another big promise. Next slide, please. So with all these promises, um, how could there possibly be challenges? Well, uh, there still are challenges. And you know, I've mentioned that we have more data than ever and, and we have a lot of data, but the ocean is really, really big. Uh, the, the ocean has a volume of 1.35 billion cubic kilometers. And, and I have a hard time imagining what a cubic kilometer is, let alone more than a billion cubic kilometers. So no matter how much data we think we have, when you divide it by 1.35 billion cubic kilometers, you start to see that the, the density of data is, is not that great. And I think as um, was pointed out, particularly in Kirsten's uh, presentation, there is a lot of variety around the globe in, in where we have data. It, there are 150 ocean countries. There are 83 countries that have more ocean than land. But if we look at these publicly available data sets that we use for making policy and, and modeling the ocean, you'll see that it, it really um, isn't equally distributed uh, around the world. And so to, to really better understand this distribution of data, uh, I've been working in the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution for the Ocean has been working very closely with IOC's International Oceanographic Information and Data Exchange to really understand how the world ocean database data is distributed around the world. And that gives us a good understanding of the global distribution of data. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So one of the things that we did as part of this analysis is we analyzed the density of data in the World Ocean Database by EEZ. So this is how much data do we have in the national waters of these 150 countries that I mentioned. And what you see in this figure here is sort of a mapping out of the density of stations. Now a station is where one variable is collected in one place at one time. And what you see here in this map is that the blue represents where fewer than one station per thousand square kilometers of surface area um, were collected in 2018 as part of the World Ocean Database. So one station per a thousand square kilometers is not enough to really be used, be able to use ocean data for sustainable development. And as this map reveals, that is the case for most of the world's ocean data. We simply do not have enough data um, in many of these national ocean areas in a global um, database like the World Ocean Database. What that means is that climate models, ocean models that are based on the World Ocean Database don't benefit from the kind of understanding that we need from these waters and these EEZs. Same thing for fisheries models. Um, anything that requires our ability to understand large scale ocean processes is going to be limited um, until we can sort of fill these gaps in the data coming from these EEZs. It also means sort of globally, we're largely unaware of what's happening um, in terms of climate change in the ocean for all these EEZs where you see blue. Of course, we can collect a lot of data about the surface and we do this from satellites, but the average ocean depth is 4,000 meters and we really need ocean variable um, and ocean data at those depths to make sense of what's happening. So we're working with uh, the IODE and the World Economic Forum to really understand what's preventing data sharing um, uh, across many of these EEZs and trying to find solutions to breaking down the barriers to data flow. 
And now, you know, it's also the case that uh, I mentioned all this new kinds of data, acoustic data, environmental DNA. It's also the case that a lot of these data are not yet being shared in global databases. And so we can't um, really bring them in and use the power of AI to create models around that kind of data. So this is another challenge we need to break down. Um, many of the most recent kinds of advances in ocean data are being collected by the private sector. And they do this um, on their own uh, investment and, and they need to make a return on that investment. So sometimes it's very expensive to buy these data and acquire these data, which means some countries just simply cannot afford a lot of the kinds of ocean data that, that are now available. And then of course, in many places, data is simply not collected um, for the ocean. And so we really need to expand our capacity to collect ocean data. And once again, I think that was reflected in uh, Kirsten um, and Karina's talks as well. Finally, it, we've heard this fit for purpose um, term used a number of times. Most ocean data, or certainly a lot of ocean data, is not collected for the specific purposes of sustainable development planning and management, which leaves a lot of managers to try to figure out how to use scientific data um, to make decisions. And so we really need to find um, more and more ways of not just co-designing science and ocean data collecting, but I think co-creating ocean science, which means working hand in hand with stakeholders and the public to collect ocean data. Fortunately, there are lots of people who are also interested in this idea of co-creation of ocean science and ocean data. My organization, the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution for the Ocean does this. It's a big part of the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development, a big part of what the Global Ocean Observing System is doing. IOCE, IODE, EMODNET. I mean, we're really getting our heads around this. And I think over the next 10 years, we're going to see big changes in how we do this. So, um, just to kind of wrap up, I, I think that we're all hoping, and we have um, really a, a lot of reason for hope, that the UN Decade of Ocean Science is really going to spur more data collecting, um, more data collecting by a wide variety of people and not just sort of government scientists. Um, and I think we're also going to see more decision makers getting involved in the co-creation process. So all of that's super positive. Ultimately, I think here, the goal is to build a data management system that creates more democratic access to that infrastructure. Um, and that means access to using data and getting data, but also access to being able to upload data. So uh, I'm really looking forward to working with all of you over the next 10 years to see how we transition our data management system and our use of data for sustainable development. And I'll end it there. Thank you, Linwood, for this uh, interesting presentation, sharing your insights and your offer for uh, working the next 10 years with us to uh, co-create and uh, collect and make data available uh, for the use of all. Thank you very much. We then uh, move to the um, science output, science outcomes, um, and who better to ask uh, to reflect on this than a highly cited researcher. We have Professor Hans Otto Pertner uh, with us. Um, Hans Otto is um, Professor and Head of Integrative Ecophysiology at Alfred Wegener Institute in Bremerhaven, Germany. He was the lead author and coordinating lead uh, to the fourth and fifth assessment cycles of the IPCC. And he is now the co-chair of the IPCC Working Group 2 for our AR6 uh, in the IPCC framework. Uh, and Hans Otto will share some insights with us on um, science outcomes, the science, the output of science, uh, ocean science in the next decade. Hans Otto, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jan, for, for this kind introduction. And um, I, I could have given, decided to give you an overview of how ocean data actually make it into IPCC assessment uh, reports, but uh, was stimulated to go a, a different, a somewhat different path, emphasizing the importance of, of those data. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you, many of you are well aware 
of our findings um, in, in the uh, special report, especially of the ocean and cryosphere in a, in a changing climate. So the thoughts I wish to share today are based on, on personal observations as IPCC co-chair, where with respect to climate, we go across all systems and regions of, of the planet. And this thinking certainly was stimulated by the three special reports we have so far done during this assessment cycle. First of all, in 2018, uh, the one report I, that I think caused the biggest uh, splash in, in, in climate history is uh, the global warming of 1.5 degrees, and then the, the report on climate change and land, and then uh, the ocean and cryosphere in, in a changing um, a climate. Um, this quite naturally brings you uh, to consider and think about the connections between the different systems looked at. So while this is an ocean event, I want us to open our blinders a bit and ask, since we are living in a period of a planetary crisis, how can ocean and land especially join forces in solving our current um, crisis? And current discussions clearly indicate that we need to overcome uh, somewhat siloed approaches. And while the ocean seems very big and large, and we've heard impressive uh, numbers uh, by our colleagues um, al already, just doing ocean research without looking at ocean land interactions and, and the planetary uh, developments is um, may, may be a, a little bit out, outdated. So I, I would uh, encourage us um, during this ocean decade to um, actually also look out uh, for, for the land. The ocean is now being recognized by the Climate Convention of the UNFCCC. This was not always so. And the ocean community had to be well organized to overcome this shortcoming. And now that we are there, we can also uh, take this opportunity to connect to other uh, fields. And um, this has already paid off. And um, we should now uh, look at things from the point of view of what we can do for the benefit of a healthy planet. So we currently have three crises that are intertwined and I'm, I want to kind of develop this parallel string of thoughts for ocean and, and land in, in the rest of the time uh, that, that I have. And these three crises, all of them involve the oceans and they all of them need ocean research. So there's a climate crisis where temperature is moving outside of those humankind enjoyed in the Holocene. Heat waves are found in many places, including marine heat, heat waves having an impact on precious ecosystems like uh, the warm water uh, corals, um, but also intertidal um, areas and, and, and so forth. We have a biodiversity crisis that is also to be seen in, in the ocean. Um, extinction rates are already high and will become higher with climate change, losses of ecosystems, are, are happening, we are seeing shifting ecosystems and new ecosystems emerging at lower biodiversity. And there is a societal crisis uh, where uh, the latter is already and emphasized uh, through COVID. It affects ocean communities. Think about the small island de development uh, states, especially people living in, in low-lying uh, clothes are exposed to ocean uh, uh, challenges. So progress also on this side, solving the societal crisis is important and it will enable uh, us not only to fill gaps in research if, if uh, uh, resources become, financial resources become available in more countries to actually go that way, but it, it also will help us to solve issues like poverty, hunger, migration, and so forth, because the oceans also play a role in, in feeding mankind, but they need to be used sustainably. And I think this is the background information we can emphasize. Resources, natural resources on land and in the ocean are currently not being used sustainably. 
So this similarity in these different aspects is not sufficiently expressed by the different scientific communities because they are not connected and they are not really uh, uh, talking uh, to each other um, enough. And we need to move outside of, of these uh, the silos. So when we talk about uh, a problem uh, we in relation to climate, we are thinking about the technological issues like technological means of mitigation, ambitious emissions reduction to bring us uh, to meet the Paris Agreement and the current NDCs with their perspective of just 1% reduction in, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions is clearly sobering in, in this uh, uh, context. Uh, research must go on on implementing solutions and, and uh, ocean research can really be, uh, be part of this effort. So when we talk about solutions, one aspect that is we are thinking of is carbon storage by, by ecosystems. What can natural ecosystems con contribute here? On land, we have soil, for example, in savannas, we have forests, we have peat as main components. And in the ocean, we have seagrasses, mangroves, kelp as forest analogues. And we have just learned that marine sediment is also important for carbon storage. Blue carbon research, I think, is picking up and is becoming uh, more, more important. But we should also consider that this carbon storage capacity is at stake. It is vulnerable to climate change. So currently we cannot encourage anybody to use ecosystem carbon storage in any accounting efforts and as an excuse to keep um, industrial and, and other anthropogenic emissions um, higher. This is certainly a, a key issue. In relation to biodiversity, uh, we have an unsustainable overuse and exploitation. And I said that already, we have biogeographical shifts which follow similar principles in the oceans as, as on land. We have new ecosystems forming due to the mixing of, of species. And it is unclear how new ecosystems will look like in the future. So we need to track these issues in, in the ocean as well as on, on land so we know how the future uh, will look like. Society is still following the paradigm of economic growth, uh, which is an issue that takes us away from sustainable uh, uses. Uh, there are threats of poverty, injustices, inequity, which are exacerbated currently and which tell us we have to solve these. Otherwise, we will not solve our other uh, global challenges. So the buzzword is transformation. We need a stabilized climate, we need ecosystem management for self-sustaining biodiversity and the ocean science can make a strong contribution here in the marine realm. We need just transition to a sustainable future for humans, for biodiversity and for a stabilized climate. Ocean research and solutions are really instrumental uh, for, for that. We should be motivated to install all of the data collecting devices, but we should also uh, streamline our activities so that sufficient that the data are, are collected in an efficient way. And we should not forget times running out with respect to reaching climate targets. Implementation and research has to go on in, in, in parallel. Um, we need to cut back on emissions more rapidly, build up uh, renewables, we need to set aside protected areas that are interconnected and allow species to follow their preferences and the moving temperatures. There needs to be sustainable use of natural resources also in the oceans. Carbon storage needs to be in, enhanced and we need governance systems, especially for the ocean and for the international waters that function in order to implement uh, the, the conservation measures and uh, regulations that, that are needed. So the siloed thinking needs to be uh, over, overcome. And uh, as a very general point of orientation, our special report on 1.5 report has emphasized very clearly reaching the sustainable development goals depends on keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees to the uh, extent uh, possible. 
So this is in a way a plea to connect communities, uh, to share the science, because many of the policy goals are, are similar, but the level of mutual information is currently limited. And at the same time, implementation and research need to go in parallel as we are running out of time for climate, climate stabilization. So we should discuss blue and, and green carbon together. We should discuss conservation targets together, like the 30 to 50% goal uh, in terms of whole surface area to set aside for protected areas. We should discuss mitigation targets and associated uh, um, um, policies, uh, considering common guardrails for ecosystems with respect to climate vulnerability and biodiversity. And last not least, the transformation of the functioning of societies depends on ocean and the land for implementing sustainable solutions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Hans, for, for your uh, insights, for your um, reflections on the science we need for the ocean we want and the planet we want uh, in, the, in the next decade. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, being very aware of the time, we should move now to the next presentation. Um, Alison, I guess, Alison Clausen will uh, give us um, a presentation on the state of the implementation plan of the ocean decade. Alison is a program specialist at the IOC, where she has a lead role in the planning coordination implementation of the UN decade. She's part of the uh, decade team and she can give us an insight in how the implementation of the decade is going and what progress has been made on the development of a monitoring and evaluation uh, framework. Alison, please. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here in, in such an illustrious company this afternoon. Um, so good morning and good afternoon to everyone today. I do want to, to give you a bit of an overview, a bit of a reminder to start off with why we even have an ocean decade. I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but just to, just to give you a reminder of, of how we arrived at this, this great initiative, the ocean decade. Essentially, it was born out of two main issues or, or two main um, constats that people became aware of. Firstly, as Karina mentioned, really the central role of the ocean and all of the sustainable development goals, as well as other regional global policy frameworks and aspirations, you know, this, this central role of the ocean became more and more understood. Um, but at the same time, the, the second, I guess, um, thing that was recognized was that yes, the ocean should have this central role, but we're still lacking significant knowledge and science to allow it to play that role. So there was this really this conundrum, if you like, that the, the ocean should be playing the central role. We need more knowledge, we need more ocean science, but that the ocean science isn't necessarily working or the ocean science system isn't necessarily working in the way we need it to be. And certainly the Global Ocean Science Report, the 2017 edition, was a major factor in helping us do a, a bit of a diagnostic, which you can see in this slide, on where we are at the moment and where we need to be or where we'd like to be um, and where we think the ocean decade can really make this difference. So where are, are we currently? We have science based on curiosity and is, which is very competent for diagnosticking or diagnosing um, the, the problem. We have major knowledge gaps, um, whether they be thematic or whether they be geographic. We have generally weak ocean literacy in the, in the general public. As Claire Jolly mentioned, we have a funding base that is mostly uh, structured around a research mode, relatively short programs with no long-term or very little long-term sustained um, financing available to really develop the, you know, that long-term investment, whether it be in capacity development or scientific research. And we have hugely uneven capacity, of course, particularly in developing countries and SIDS, but also across genders, across generations. So where would we like to be? How can we have a, an ocean science system that could really deliver the knowledge we need so that the ocean can play its central role? Well, we need 
science that provides solutions and motivates action. As Lynn Wood very clearly pointed out, we need accessible ocean data. So all that masses of ocean data that is there, that it's accessible and it can be used. It's in the hands of the people that need it. We have an ocean literate society that understands the value of the ocean, can make decisions. And then we have a, a change in the way that funding and resources are really liberated so that it's a, it's a different type of, of resource commitment for ocean science. And we also have a much stronger focus on capacity development and transfer of technology. So you can see many of these things are the sorts of issues that the Global Ocean Science Report is measuring and is tracking, and they're the sorts of things we want to achieve under the ocean decade. So it already starts to show you that the very important link between the Global Ocean Science Report really is a, as a critical tool or a mechanism to be able to able to help us see how the ocean decade is, uh, is progressing and how we're, we're, we're making this transition um, in the ocean science system. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Just a reminder for you, from some of you, as we move from, uh, from, this, from this abstract idea, from this understanding of the need for the ocean decade to, a, to now what we have as a, as a concrete initiative, obviously there have been many steps that we've, we've gone through. Um, the, the United Nations General Assembly has, has, has looked at, approved and, 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 and accepted different, um, different documents and analyses. And the, the latest or the, I guess the ultimate step in this process that has been underway since uh, 2016 was the, um, the recent uh, acceptance by the, the United Nations General Assembly of the implementation plan for the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. This implementation plan is available on the Ocean Decade website. If you haven't had a look at it, um, it's actually quite a relatively long document, but there's also this summary version, which you can see the covers here. I really recommend that you do that because it gives a very good overview of the framework which is going to be used to roll out the, um, the ocean decade over, over the next 10 years and the way that we see different actors can play a role in helping achieve the, uh, the objectives and the aims of the ocean decade. We can move to the next slide, please. This slide here tries to give a, I guess, a very quick snapshot of some of the key elements of that, of that implementation plan. So again, this is described in more detail in the document, but here I'll go through some of the, you know, what we feel are the, the, the key elements to, to understand about the decade. First of all, the vision of the decade, of the science we need for the ocean we want, which ties back to the, to the, to the first slide where I talked about really that, you know, the, where we are now with ocean science and where we'd like to be in the future. One thing to note, I think, in the vision that's really important is we're not just talking about what may be a relatively tradition or traditional or um, a limited view of how we define ocean science. We have a much broader view of ocean science in the decade, um, which is, is also built on the, on the definitions used in the Global Ocean Science Report that takes into account, account Indigenous and local knowledge. It takes into account the capacity development, the data, the transfer of marine technology, and it really aims to have a very broad uh, vision and definition of ocean science. You can see then the, the mission for the ocean decade as well. So we're very focused on transformative ocean science, really moving past business as usual. We're focused on science, which is, is looking for solutions for sustainable development. So really trying to make these links to the sustainable development goals and other regional and global policy frameworks. And we're looking at science that can, at the end of the day, connect people and our ocean and create systemic and individual behavior change so that humanity's relationship with the ocean changes the way we make decisions, the way we manage the ocean decisions, because we have the knowledge to take the right action. The decade ocean uh, framework, which is shown on the right hand uh, right hand side of the of the of the screen tries to sum up in one graphic how the decade is structured so if we start from the from the bottom we have the the, the decade actions which will be the programs and the projects and the the different initiatives initiatives and activities that will be carried out by the the ocean community very broadly across the life of the decade so here we're really looking for the community to come together to form innovative partnerships to work in in ways to co-design to co-deliver programs and projects and activities that will fulfill the ambition of the, of the decade. These actions are not already identified. They will be solicited through calls for decade actions. And many of you will have seen the, the call that just closed in January. There'll be another, another call coming up later, later this year as well. And there will be regularly um, calls for decade actions throughout, throughout the life of the decade. 
these decade actions as, as, as partners are developing them and, and submitting them to be recognized as part of the decade will be organized in two ways. First around decade objectives, which are really the steps in the ocean science value chain. So looking from the identification of the science to the generation of the science, to the use of that science. So for, for the decade, all of those steps are, are equally important. And we're really looking at actions that can tie into different steps of that value chain. And then they're also organized around these 10 ocean decade challenges, which are really the most immediate and pressing needs of the decade. And they relate to, to a range of issues, including data, um, coming back to Linwood's presentation, to capacity development, to ocean literacy. There are challenges related to multiple ocean stresses, um, to pollution, to the ocean climate nexus, as well as some of the infrastructure needs, so ocean observing. Um, infrastructure or multi-hazard early warning systems. So these 10 ocean decade challenges really aim to give very clear entry points and we'll be, we'll be building communities of practice throughout the decade around these challenges to really stimulate and catalyze collective action between different actors who are carrying out decade actions. All these decade actions that are then organized around the objectives and around the challenges will come together to fulfill a series of 10, oh, sorry, seven decade outcomes, which represent the characteristics of the ocean we want at the end of the decade. And together, these outcomes will contribute to, to the achievement of the 2030 agenda as well as other regional and global policy frameworks, UNFCCC, the CBD, um, Sendai framework, the Samoa pathway, the, the emerging BBNJ um, instrument, et cetera. On the left of, the, of this slide, it also shows a very important part of the decade, which is around stakeholder engagement um, and collaboration. I mentioned the communities of practice, which will be one way that stakeholders can engage in the decade through a, glo a global stakeholder forum, which is currently um, being developed and will be progressively rolled out. So there'll be communities of practice that look at these different challenges. There'll also be communities of practice that look at a, at a, at a more ge geographic focus so that actors working in the same ocean basin area can also be exchanging and collaborating. And then there'll also be communities of practice that are more sectorally based. So for example, a space where private sector actors within the decade can come together or early career ocean professionals within the decade can come together. And the idea is that through this global stakeholder forum, no matter who you are, you can find your unique place within the decade based on the thematic priorities that you're working on, the geographies that you're working on, and the main sectoral um, interests that you have. And the Global Stakeholder Forum will essentially provide a, a platform for different collaborations, new partnerships to be created, for opportunities for action to be identified and to be, um, to be acted on throughout, throughout the decade. If we can move to the next slide, please. So given that this is the, the framework for the decade, tying back to some of the, the earlier discussions and particularly in relation to the Global Ocean Science Report, how are we going to measure progress? How are we going to measure if any of this happens? And why do we need to measure progress? Well, essentially we need to me measure the progress throughout the decade so that we can generate the information needed that can tell the story of whether or not we've been successful in creating transformative change in undertaking, disseminating and using ocean science throughout the ocean decade. So this is a massive, massive challenge, as you can, as you can imagine. What we have done over the last six months or so is uh, set up an informal working group. And, and Jens, as he mentioned, is, is, is one of the, the, the members of this, as is, as is Claire Jolly as well. And, and we have about 12 to 12 or 13 members of that informal working group, which has been working extremely hard since October or November last year to really develop a, uh, a conceptual or a first stage conceptual monitoring and evaluation framework. Um, and that monitoring and evaluation framework was recently presented to the first meeting of the Interim Decade Advisory Board for their, for their feedback and comments. And this, this framework is really based on some, you know, some, some key principles. First, that it needs to be simple, it needs to be practical, it needs to be achievable, and it shouldn't um, place an increased uh, pressure or, or burden on stakeholders. It needs to be able to evolve over the course of the decade, it needs to really optimize the use of pre-existing processes, methodologies, indicators, and this includes the Global Ocean Science Report. 
it needs to be standardized, impact driven, inclusive, and it needs to be open in terms of its accessibility. If we can move to the next slide, please. So the the, the framework is shown shown in this in this next slide. We may have a may have a bit of a technical issue there. Anyway, I'll keep going because I know we're getting very very short on time, and I'm sure we'll come to the slide in a moment. But the the, the framework for monitoring and evaluation essentially aims to measure progress of the decade at at many different levels. So it measures progress. First of all, how is the decade contributing to some of these big global processes, such as the Sustainable Development Goals or other, other global or policy frameworks? It aims to measure progress against the outcomes and the challenges. It aims to measure the more operational progress against the actions. But I think one of the really interesting parts for us today is this part on the left, where it's also aiming to measure progress in the enabling environment around ocean science. And this is where, tying back to what I just said about the framework wanting to build on existing processes, on existing methodologies, this is where the, the, the work that is being done and the lessons and the experience with the Global Ocean Science Report have such an important role to play. Because as we're measuring progress in the development of this enabling environment uh, for ocean science, we want to be measuring things like capacity development, like diversity in ocean science, like funding, and that includes both the volume and the type of funding. And Claire made that, that comment that we need to also look at the type of funding when we're looking at funding. It wants to measure how science is used, what the access to, to, to technology is, what scientific publications, how the, how the diversity and distribution of scientific publications is, is changing. So all of this are things that we want to measure as part of that enabling environment. So in that sense, for the decade, the Global Ocean Science Report plays a vital role. The 2017 and, and more recently the 2020 versions really give that baseline against which progress over the decade can be, can be measured. And some of the indicators and methodologies that have been developed for the Global Ocean Science Report, which are measuring those, those indicators at a national level, will also be adapted and used either at a programmatic level or a thematic level or at a geographic level so that we've got comparable um, information and data on some of these key indicators about the enabling environment. In terms of next steps for monitoring and evaluation, um, and I think I'll, I'll I'll leave this as my next slide, and then hang over, as my sorry as my last slide, and then hang over to hand over to the next speaker. In the next steps for monitoring and evaluation, we will take that conceptual framework and continue working with the informal working group to build out a more de detailed discussion paper, including the operational aspects of how monitoring and evaluation will be undertaken. This is going to include an inventory of ex existing indicators. Um, an in inventory of existing methods and looking at how existing systems and processes, including the Global Ocean Science Report, can be used to measure progress of the decade. We'll be identifying new indicators where they're needed, and then we'll be looking at resourcing and training needs for the rollout of the M&E framework throughout the decade. And there, for example, looking at other possible links to Global Ocean Science Report processes. And then we'll be working with proponents of decade actions, as well as the decentralized coordination structures of the decade to to pilot, refine, and operate, operationalize the monitoring and evaluation framework. So hopefully there'll be a lot more information coming out on this over the, over the course of 2021. And I hope we'll have the, the opportunity to speak to you again and give you an update on progress on how the, 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 the system for measuring progress of the ocean decade is, is really um, taking shape in, in coming months. And with that, I will, um, I will end and I will um, hand, back to, uh, hand back to Jan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. Thank you for your uh, presentation, for sharing this work, and thank uh, thanks to the decade team at IOC for uh, aligning this and for for your heart and uh, high quality work in uh, putting this decade on the rails. Um, we now move to our our last panelist, uh, last but not least, uh, Jay Hack Lee. Um, a physical oceanographer from the Korea Institute of uh, Ocean Science and Technology, who will give us a member state's perspective uh, on introducing best practices uh, for uh, inventorying and uh, the status and future of ocean science in the Republic of Korea and uh, inserting this into the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Jayak Lee, please, the floor is yours. 
Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, time is very limited now, so I'll speed it up. I'll talk about uh, ocean science in Korea, uh, focusing on the context of the ocean science, not just to work. Uh, this map shows that our course of trend is increasing the number of research institutes. Uh, the GSL 22 shows that number of researchers are close to 1,000, but that this may be underestimated. Uh, next slide. Uh, this table shows the ocean related uh, research institute in Korea. The kiosk is the biggest one, and others are very specialized, like polar ocean, fisheries, uh, marine pollution, and so on. The Korea Ocean Data Center uh, is operated by the National Institute of Fisheries Science. Next slide. Okay, next uh, trend is that the R&D budget is increasing very rapidly. Uh, next slide. Uh, for the ocean science funding, as a share of GDP is the first place in the world, and the annual budget for the ocean and fisheries last year is about uh, 600 million US dollars and the increasing rate uh, over the past five years uh, is about 6% very huge. Next. The next trend is that the, the demand for the applied research is getting stronger than for pure research. All those uh, related to the issues related to climate change, environmental problem and the harmful blooms. The marine heat waves, microplastic, and uh, blooming thalassum hornady is uh, new keywords in Korea now. Next. And another trend is that the number of the research infrastructure is gradually increased. I chose the three examples. First one is a geostationary satellite with the ocean color imager called the Koshi. The Koshi one is retired uh, months ago, and now Koshi 2 is in operation. And we have the old classic history vessels, about 6,000 tons, and, uh, and icebreak list vessels. We are now planning to build a uh, second one. And that, uh, a series of observation platform and surface buoy uh, were installed in the yellow sheet like this one. Next slide. Because of the best we have, the research area is in, uh, expanding. The, in Korea, the overshare observation is begun mid 1990s at the Okinawa Trop and then expanded to a tropical Pacific Ocean and Southern Ocean, Arctic Ocean. Now some researchers go to Indian Oceans. Next slide. And uh, another trend is that the contribution to the international program is increasing. Uh, though the rate of contribution by Korea is very, very low, but uh, the signal is uh, getting better. For example, Ocean Site, next one. Next slide. Our program, next slide. Next, uh, Global Future Programs. Uh, we deployed uh, 92 scripts last year, uh, provided by NOAA, uh, mainly in the Northwestern Pacific Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. Next one. And uh, this uh, another example of the cooperation with NOAA. Uh, Kiosk is maintaining a carbon uh, monitoring buoy uh, near the Chuk Island here. Uh, marked by yellow uh, color. Next one. Next one. Okay, now I'll explain about the future of ocean science in Korea. Uh, I'll introduce the basic plan for the oceans and the fisheries development for this decade, uh, provided by and prepared by Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries of the Korean government. Uh, there are three goals. Next slide. 
and the sixth implementation strings, the numbers multiply red colors uh, closely related to the ocean science. The base, the one that is straight is, next slide. Uh, there are many uh, main policy tasks. I selected some. The first one is uh, enhancement of the database, the natural digest prediction. And the second one is mapping the value of marine ecosystem service. And the whole cycle management of marine debris, including microplastic and the global cooperation in response to climate change. And there is a word about active participation in the UN Ocean Decade. Next slide. So that you can imagine that the uh, direction of the ocean science research in Korea in this decade. So the future outlook is uh, not much different from the current state, uh, but the demand for the applied research became more, much more stronger. Uh, and also the new world is uh, uh, data transformation, uh, like uh, uh, machine learning, AI, and big data, uh, data pairs and so on. And also the, the ocean decade is a new world for the uh, future uh, directions. So the, the box marked by uh, red color, but I think that there is a need to narrow the relationship between scientists and the end users, including general public. Uh, this one is related to the applied research because many general public or uh, end users want to something to do uh, for hot issues I explained before. So that this approach may help uh, secure ocean science funding. Next slide. Our right box shows that uh, surface currents uh, in the Northwestern Pacific Ocean. And the biggest current is the Crochio, uh, which is very important in this region. Uh, this current carries the heat from polar ocean to the north, northern side. And this one is very important because uh, it's uh, kind of the internal boundary in terms of material exchange between Asian continent and Pacific Ocean. But the lab uh, box shows that most area in this uh, Northwestern Pacific Ocean is classified uh, as a EEG. This means that in any event, the research work is uh, for the research work, international collaboration is essential. So the uh, this kind of collaboration is uh, a way to remove barriers for open access to the data. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll finish now. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for sharing this perspective from, uh, yeah, it's fair to say, one of the leading countries in the IOC community uh, with regard to uh, global ocean science. So thanks a lot for this presentation. Um, I'll put my camera back on. Um, uh, thanking you all um, for being here with us. Unfortunately, as you have been able to see in the chat, we don't have time for a formal live Q&A session in an interactive session uh, today. Um, we, ha we had too much information to share with you. Uh, our panelists did excellently. Eh? They all had a very small time slot, but a lot of things to tell uh, and to share with you. I think uh, if I see the reactions in the chat that this was very much appreciated. I personally appreciate it very much. And I want to thank all my panelists for uh, their excellent uh, contributions, very complimentary and giving us a flavor of the broadness of marine science and the challenges that we face uh, entering this decade, but also the great opportunities we have now that we have this baseline and we have this UN decade as a big enabler uh, for ocean science in mobilizing uh, capacity investments um, worldwide uh, on a global scale. That's what we do it for. Uh, I hope to um, see you all in the near future. Thank you all attendees for being here with us and interacting through the Q&A and the chat uh, with the panelists. We will follow up on your questions, 
shortly. Uh, you also have been given uh, Kirsten's email address uh, to uh, formulate even more questions uh, that will be answered uh, in due time when you uh, think of them. Uh, join, keep joining us, uh, feel welcome in this community, and uh, we hope to meet again live somewhere soon or virtually. Bye-bye, everyone. Uh, have a nice day. See you all in the future. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.